back in a bit, but I think everyone, otherwise everybody's here, so we'll start. Okay, so today we're gonna discuss dengue, 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 and Wolbachia, however you pronounce it. Wolbachia, Wolbachia. Wolbachia. Um, all right. Um, dengue is the worst of all the arboviruses, kills the most of all arboviruses. So dengue's like the worst. Uh, 3.9 billion, billion, what's the population of the earth? Like 7 billion? 4.5. That's, that's how many, that's how many billion years that, to the age of the earth. Uh, so essentially like, I'll probably like more than half of the world's population is exposed to dengue. So this is the numbers that risk infection. Uh, there are about 50, Million. Thank you. Oh wait. Oh no. Alejandro requested to not close the door. <laughs> uh -huh. There are about 50 million cases per year. The disease is endemic in about a hundred countries, and it's in Africa, the Americas, um, Mediterranean, Asia, Southeast Asia and the Western Pacific. Occasionally, you get outbreaks in Australia, and what typically will be happening when that happens is perhaps a traveler goes on vacation, they get dengue, and then they fly back, and then if they fly back in a region that has the mosquitoes, you can get outbreaks in Australia. So it's essentially like everywhere. Uh, it's called, another name, a colloquial name for it is break bone fever. Because supposedly, I've never had it, but supposedly it's so um, painful that it feels like your bones are breaking. Has anybody had it in the class? No, I haven't. Like, like, what did like you say? Pain. No, I never like, had, like, had. Like the ache. Like, like the ache. It feels like your bones are breaking. It's supposedly what people say. Um, there's no treatment for it. There's no treatment. There are candidates for vaccines, but the vaccines as of now are not super helpful. Maybe that will change in the future. And so it's a perfect example of a disease that we really, um, really the only effective tools for dengue right now are vector control. So it's really kind of a case scenario for the usage of vector control and logical control. I'm just gonna close this door. Okay, close the door. Okay. okay. Um, couple just like things about it before we talk about the paper. The main vector is what? Aegypti. 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 So Aegypti. 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 And what's the lesser vector? I will pick this. So both of these are vectors. Aegypti. Aegypti is the main one. So it's mainly tropical disease. If you see capital D-A-E-N-V, that's dengue virus, and it's like the abbreviation, and you'll see dengue one, two, three, or four. These are the serotypes. What are serotypes? Basically yeah, different variants. So essentially, viruses mutate very quickly. That's an interesting question. Why do viruses mutate quickly? Yes, so there's a high a high mutation rate, but why is that? Uh, so but mechanistically, like why do they why doesn't your DNA mutate at the same rate the as a step, virus? The step from going to RNA to DNA has a lot of mistakes in the transcript that's reverse per base pair. There's an increased mutation rate associated with that design. That might be that might be true, but there's there's something more fundamental. Like why do why do your why do you your DNA has an inherent error rate, but it's much lower. Why is it much lower? Oh, they don't have the thing that checks when they copy over it. There's no proofreading. Yeah. So so viruses typically don't have proofreading, which essentially like as a polymerase is reading, there are some polymerases that can detect an error and then they will essentially like backpedal or that error will be corrected. Also, there's things like homologous recombination in your cells that repair DNA sequences. 
Additionally, viruses don't have a mechanism of proofreading and repairing the DNA. So when it gets copied, whatever you get is what you get. And that means it's a high error rate, but it also means it's a very high adaptation rate. And so when you see the serotypes of the different variants of dinghy, um, these are, they have SNPs in their genomes that make them different. So they're definitely like, they're, they are different in evolution. Um, and that's due to this high mutation rate. I think, so you can fact check me on this, I think traditionally the different dengue serotypes were located in different regions of the globe, but nowadays they're, that because of people traveling everywhere, they're essentially like all over. And I think in South America they have all the variants, they have all the variants of dengue. So you're potentially, depending on where you are, you could get all four or one or two or three or four, and we'll talk about the complications of that. Are you saying you think maybe they evolved separately throughout? across the world and then yes they're all together that's what I think right. that's what I think but you'd have to fact check me on that to be sure but my um, my right. assumption and my knowledge tells me that these originally were in different geographical locations and then have spread and become mixed gotcha. um, through travel okay um, the location is, is typically again typically in the tropics hot weather that overlaps with the Aedes aegypti um, and the extrinsic incubation period is about eight to 12 days. So those are just some sort of like facts. What type of virus is ding dengue? So we went, the last two lectures were types of viruses. What Are type of virus? virus, flavivirus? Yes, it's a flavivirus. Flavivirus, it's an RNA virus. What type, what type of, what's the genome? What type of RNA? Single stranded. Single stranded RNA plus or minus? Plus, that's correct. So it's a single-stranded RNA plus virus, so that's important for the classification. It encodes a polyprotein. We all remember what a polyprotein is? Yes, okay. And it is enveloped. So these are the things you would want to remember about flaviviruses and maybe it fits within the flaviviruses. Okay, more stuff. More stuff about dengue. It is called a I'm always, I always spell this wrong, it's hard to spell. Hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic fever. What does, what does that mean? What does that make you think of? Uh, blood. Blood. The blood counts. Blood counts. When you say blood, so. Blood cells. Well, hemorrhaging is what? Hemorrhage. It's like bleeding, right? <laughs> it's like internal bleeding. If you look through Beckman, like hemorrhagic fever or like Dengue people now they are calling just like severe dengue, dengue and the dengue like they, they call are it trying to not use not using that like the hemorrhagic syndrome or hemorrh dengue shock syndrome. Dengue, shock syndrome. I've heard DSS. Yeah. Yeah. They they are trying to avoid saying that. They would rather say severe, severe dengue. What's the reason? What's the rationale behind that? I mean, my. Like, yeah, I say that not all the severe cases show like the That's constellation of symptoms that are characterized by the hemorrhagic, I but see. still the patients are considered like severe dengue infections. I see. Okay, so we will talk about severe dengue or DSS in a second. The, so the term hemorrhagic fever, so as was suggested, not all people who get dengue experience all these different things. And most of the severe symptoms of dengue happen when you have already been infected once and you get infected again, the different serotype. So there's sort of like gradations of dengue. And if you get dengue just for the first time and it's just one um, serotype, you're probably not you're probably not gonna be that badly hurt from it. You'll probably just get over it. It'll be a horrible experience for maybe like two weeks. Um, but there are other forms of dengue which get much worse. So hemorrhagic fevers in general, so let me, uh, to discuss that, what happens when you get dengue in some cases is um, it will infect the endothelial lining of your of your circulatory system and eventually and essentially like you just leak out into your body and it will like disintegrate your organs. So one of my one of my advisors used to used to say that like um, they essentially like your organs will kind of like dissolve if you get if you get some of these. So it's a nasty it's a nasty disease. Um, you die from, if you die from dengue, you die often from multi-organ failure. Let's see. Okay, so other things about it. If you get it, 
and you get, if you just get one strain of it and you get over it, typically you are immune to that one particular strain. Okay, but the problem is getting a second infection with a second strain. So the, the term that we, uh, that was brought up, severe dengue, or if they're trying to not use that, or not use other terms anymore, before this was referred to as dengue shock syndrome, DSS, dengue shock syndrome. And maybe that's a term that we should not use anymore instead, maybe I guess severe dengue. What happens in this case is, say you've gotten dengue once and you've been infected with one serotype, and then you're in a spot where there are multiple serotypes, okay? So what happens in your body is after you get infected with one, what's gonna walk me through like what happens to your immune system? So you have a virus infection, what happens in your immune system? Uh, it'll break down the virus and then use that to make antibodies. Yeah, so antibodies will get made. And what cells display the antibodies? Well, don't go that much into immunology. Like in general, what types of cells? Leukocytes, B cells. Yeah, and they were like white blood cells, right? Yes. Yeah, so essentially like white blood cells. My point is essentially like not your liver cells, not your brain cells. Like there's white blood cells that are responsible, that have antibodies that go and attack foreign bodies. And there's different types of immunity cells, but in general like immunity cells. Okay, so, um, if you are immune to one virus, your white blood cells now have antibodies that can recognize that virus, and they can, uh, I guess, conquer or get rid of that virus, okay? But there is a problem. What if there's a virus that can infect white blood cells? So dengue can infect white blood cells. And so if you get infected with a second strain, so let's say it's an infection Let's say this first one you get infected with dengue one. And then second time you get infection with dengue virus two, okay? There's a phenomenon where antibodies, it's called cross-reacting. What's cross-reacting? Probably it's like, it's almost like non-specific, so it will interact it, with multiple different serotypes. It can be non-specific, yeah. It can be non-specific, although in this case it's not quote-unquote non-specific. It's, but in this case, it's rather where the first antibodies that you developed for this one, if they also recognize the second one, that can lead to a weird scenario where, say you have this antibody, you have this white blood cell that has these antibodies, and you get infected with the second virus, it's dengue two. You, you might not be immune to dengue two, you might only be immune to dengue one. But because of this interaction, this crossover interaction, because the viruses are very similar. But in this case, now it's a horrible scenario because the second serotype, dengue 2, can now more easily find your white blood cells and then it binds them and gets absorbed or endocytosis and then the virus cycle happens inside your white blood cells. So this can make things worse. It can essentially like the cross reaction of the antibodies, even though you're not immune, can generate scenarios where now your infection is much, much, much worse. And this is what people die from. This is the, the what they used to call the dengue shock syndrome or severe dengue. Um, there's also, to, so this has a term. This is a specific term, it's called antibody dependent enhancement. And this is actually a really unique issue. So now think about developing vaccines for dengue. Why, why would you, I'm not an anti-vaxxer, but why might you be skeptical of dengue vaccines? It's like you already are on step two. Yes, yeah, it might be a terrible idea to get a dengue vaccine if you live in a place where there's multiple serotypes. Because depending on what vaccine you get, um, you might be vaccinated against one serotype and that might already bring you, as you said, to step two. And then as soon as you get dengue, you might create it worse. Further, or furthermore, there's situations where if you, these are all, the flavies are all sort of like related. They're related viruses. And so think of all the other flavy viruses. What are the other ones? Zika. Zika. West Nile virus. Yep, West Nile virus and then yellow fever. These ones do have vaccines. And there's also some studies where um, if you get, say, a vaccine for a vaccine that's being developed for one of these, 
you might create a situation where then down the line, if you get dengue, you might go straight into dengue shock syndrome because not only because you perhaps not have had a vaccine for dengue, but you might have had a vaccine for something else. So developing vaccines for this is kind of, um, I would say difficult certainly because you have to worry about this whole situation. Um, and there are lots of reports of this phenomenon happening. So that's, that's sort of like one of the most unique things and uh, scary things about dengue. So on our side, that's not a good thing, but at least that presents an opportunity where maybe the best way to control dengue then is with control of the vector as opposed to developing a vaccine. What kind of mortality are we looking at? With, with dengue? With dengue shock syndrome? Well, no, well, not with just dengue shock syndrome, but with like initial infection. With an initial infection, I think the mortality is very low. It's I don't I don't know for sure, but it's it, it's going to be like a low number. Like it's it's not high. You're unlikely to die from dengue in a first infection, unless maybe you're like immunocompromised or right. like a baby or something. Sure. Um, yeah, I should I should get an actual mortality number. Okay, so that's the sort of the gist of dengue. Let's bring in now the Wolbachia paper. So. Wolbachia, as we have discussed, this will probably be the last Wolbachia paper, but it fits well and helps us transition to dengue and flaming viruses. Um, Wolbachia is known to inhibit uh, single-stranded RNA viruses. That's a V. Of which dengue is one. Okay. So the title of this paper was, let's see here. Uh, the WML Wolbachia strain blocks dengue and invades cage Aedes aegypti populations. So this is from Hoffman and O'Neill, uh, who are big Wolbachia groups. This was sort of like one of the first big nature papers on the, the fact that this Wolbachia thing was actually potentially gonna work. And it was sort of like setting up some caged field trials to test the initial Wolbachia systems for the ability to block dengue virus. Okay, so there's a couple things I wanna talk about in the um, introduction. So, the, what's the idea? Walk me through the idea. This vector control, or not vector control, actually this is not vector control. How is this not vector control? Because you're not uh, changing the actual vector, you're changing something within it. Well, you're not killing the actual vector, you're sort of like replacing it. So it's, so it's population replacement. And what's the idea? Like what's gonna happen? How are they gonna set this up? For people, this was the e this was the easy short paper. So, how was, what's the basic idea? You get a lot of male mosquitoes, Wolbachia, release them into the population, so they breed. So, wait, let's talk about that first point. You said give a lot of male mosquitoes, Wolbachia. Are they releasing they're males? They're releasing females. They're releasing probably both, I think. I but but it gen essentially they're releasing females. So this is like the reciprocal case. So don't get confused about population replacement versus uh, sterile insect technique, or IIT. In one case, you're releasing males and you're trying to kill the population. That's not what they're doing. In this case, they're releasing females. What's the females that they're releasing, or they want to release, or that they're gonna test release of? What's unique about the females? They're like Yes, and there were actually two Wolbachias. Did you catch what the two Wolbachias were? Yes, so there were two Wolbachias. So WML versus WML pop. So this was, if you go back, this was in the state of the field where we, we had the idea, we, we, they knew that Wolbachia had this ability to inhibit single-stranded RNA viruses in vectors, but they weren't quite sure which Wolbachia infection was the best. And there was also sort of this competing idea um, I can't remember how much I talked about this, but I do believe I talked about in the early Wolbachia lectures. In the earlier days, they were really interested in this particular infection, WML pop. Does anybody know why? Because it reduced the lifespan. Yes. This was the one that reduced, that they were saying reduced the lifespan. Um, and so perhaps they were thinking maybe they could get like a double bang for their buck, like reduce the lifespan and inhibit a single strand in RNA viruses. And so they were sort of comparing this to that. What's the catch of this reduced lifespan? Did anybody catch like the problem 
essentially like again like there's a there's a reason they're testing this versus that and there's a theoretical problem that this one has that this one might not have it reduces fitness. yes like if it's reducing lifespan that's going to reduce the fitness and that's a big no-no if you are trying to replace the population that's a hard thing to overcome okay so if you read their introduction closely they say something like, quote, success of the impl implementation depends on two things. Let me, let me actually just erase this. So they say success depends on two things. Did anybody catch what they are? So the second one was already said, the fitness cost of Wabakia what was this, the other thing? Was it egg hatcheries? Egg hatchery? No. Oh, or was it uh, it's like the initial like introduction of how much you put in? Because it has yes, a there's a name for that. Like it has a threshold for it. Yes, good, very good. Okay, so that's called the frequency. The frequency. So the frequency is essentially like the percent of the population that are infected with Wolbachia. Explain to me, so I wanna, I wanna make sure, this is actually like really important for Wolbachia applications. Um, and these go into the models of whether it's gonna work or not. So I wanna try to spend a little bit of time explaining, making sure we totally understand this. Why, well, let's, let's first, this one's, we'll talk about this one second. Let's talk about number two first, the fitness cost of Wolbachia. Um, tell me mechanistically exactly like why that would cause a problem. Maybe it's too obvious. Like, like what are all the bad things that could happen if, if, the, if there is a fitness cost to having Wolbachia? Uh, it'll be bred out basically. Yeah, it'll be bred out. You could have decreased um, maternal Transmission. It could be you, bred out. Would be it wouldn't be breeding, but it would be selected against. So these these mosquitoes might be dying faster, and they would not be reproducing. That's going to all relate to the fitness cost. So if you're trying to replace a population and it's and there's a selection against it, you already have something against you. How could you overcome that? They talk about they talk about that. So if, if, for example, if this is the case with WML pop and there's a fitness cost to WML pop, why even, why even bother testing that? Like if we already know there's a fitness cost and it's gonna be selected against, why even bother wasting your time testing it? Like a really high vector, like confidence reduction. But if you can't get it to replace, or can you get it to replace? That's my question. If you put it in the Yes, so that's the key thing is, this in theory could still work if you knew what the threshold was, like how much you need to put out. Maybe you just need to put out like way more and then eventually it would, that would, that would help a sort of, um, that would make it easier to replace the population. So even though it's selected against, if you just throw out enough of them, you might be able to get it to replace. That's one reason why they're testing that. So the fitness cost in theory, if it's slow enough, it could be overcome by just releasing large numbers. Okay, and then the frequency percent, this is sort of, let's, let's talk about this. Um, this, is, this is, I try to explain this, but it's, it's quite difficult to sort of quickly explain. Um, if you think about the, so if you think about CI, so cytoplasmic incompatibility, and I always drew these graphs with the percent um, infection, so that would actually be the frequency. The y-axis would be frequency of the Wolbachia infection. And I drew graphs that look sort of um, like this. And if this, is, if, if this starts at zero, if it starts at zero, this is wrong. The graphs do not look like that. This can never happen. Like, why does there need to be some so the graphs, what they look like, if it works, will look something like this. Why would this work, but this would not work? 
But but why would say releasing? So what they, they what's the actual number that they list in the paper? They list an actual number for this frequency. It's a little bit below 80%. I think this is 0 0.65. So it's like just above 50% of the population. So I'm imagining, I don't know exactly their calculations, but I'm imagining if you had a population in the wild of 100 mosquitoes, you'd have to release essentially 165 mosquitoes, something like that, to outcompete. If I, so I might be doing the math wrong, but it's essentially like some kind of number that you can use to calculate how many you actually need to release if you know the numbers in the field. And my question is, why, why wouldn't something like 0.33% um, frequency, why wouldn't that work? Because with like each generation, you're slowly freaking it out if it's not like higher than 50%. Yeah, so, so, so understand what's happening actually at the molecular level in CI. So think about, think about so if I, I don't want to erase this, Think about um, there are, so there are these toxins and there are these antidotes, okay? And think about, let's think about like this, the ecological selection conditions. I'm not an ecologist and people are probably gonna get mad at me online about what I, the terms I use, um, but like I'm just trying to get your heads around this. So in, in Wabaka, see it works like a toxin antidote system. And let's think about like how the evolutionary pressures that govern these systems. So if you just had a toxin, one gene by itself, is there any advantage to having a to just like a random toxin that kills you or sterilizes you? So this is gonna be deleterious or advantageous? It's gonna be deleterious, okay. And if you just have, let's, let's cover this up. Let's cover this up and let's say if you have an antidote by itself, what is that going to be? Deleterious or advantageous? Isn't it deleterious if there's no toxin to the antidote for it? What would you say? Well, if there's no toxin for the antidote, it's deleterious because it's extra stuff to make. It's, so it's actually not advantageous. So it could be, it could be deleterious. Deleterious. If there's no, if the, you're saying, if there's no toxin in the population, yeah, yeah. like there's no utility to having that whatsoever. And so then you just sort of have extra information that costs energy to replicate. Mm -hmm. Or what else could it be? It could be advantageous if you have a toxin to use it. It could be advantageous if there is a toxin in the population that on some percentage you need to like pull out, it's like, a, it's like having like an extra key that opens up some doors. And if you randomly encounter the door where your key opens up, then like you might, there might be a situation where it could be advantageous. What else could it be? There's actually middle ground here. That, yeah, this is a word for that, it's neutral. Neutral is kind of like, well, the energy to replicate that probably isn't that much, you probably don't even notice it. And so like just sort of like walking around with an extra key might not be a bad idea in the spare, in the case of like evolutionary history where you randomly might encounter like some. So it could be in theory like any combination of these things. And um, so, so, okay, now let's think about like the linked system. So let's say they somehow come together through linkage and you have, and you have this system, okay? Now what, let's think about like the linked system. What are, what are our thoughts about the system together? Is it in total deleterious or advantageous or neutral? Is it deleterious to you if you have the antidote to your own toxin? No. No, it's not really, so, so essentially like having them linked together removes the selection against having this thing. And essentially it probably becomes like a neutral system. Under what conditions does it become advantageous? Do you want more of these things in the population or less? If you're in a population that has essentially like a low number of these systems, is it going to be okay? So let's let's make a let's make a actually let's make a, like a table, and let's in the in the table let's put um, let's put frequency frequency of CI genes. So how many, it's essentially like a readout of frequency of Wolbachia infection, but let's just say frequency of these genes in a population. 
So if it's high versus low, if having these genes, the frequency is low, are they going to be advantageous or deleterious? Which or genes specifically? Are you both. Talking? You have both. Now they're linked together. It's, if it's low, it's deleterious to have because your interaction is going to be low with, others, with other individuals. Yeah, it's probably going to be deleterious or low because the odds of you encountering the door that's locked is very low if the frequency is low. If the frequency is high or above some threshold, then what does it become? It becomes advantageous. So, advantageous. So again, like I'll probably get ripped to shreds by like ecologists, but this is essentially like the idea in the best words that I can explain it. And whatever this threshold number is, is the crossover number of the frequency at which it then like sort of becomes useful to have this system. Does that make sense? And there's mathematical models and calculations where people calculate it's exactly 0.65, like, and there's those theoretical models like have a bunch of like determinants and fitness things that go into that. Okay, so that's that's the essentially like the general idea. We all understand that? I have a question. Yes. So how does it initially start in a population? That's a good it's a good question, and people are trying to figure that out. Like, yeah, that's sort of like a chicken egg paradox of how does Wabakia establish itself um, in a population if it's below the threshold in natural context? There's actually some easy answers to that. Like, that's actually worth discussing. That's what um, Michael Torelli studies. So what, what do you think? How, how, might you, how might you lower this, this threshold? Or even there's Wabakia that can, there's Wabakia that can spread even though they don't have CI factors. Explain that to me. That's actually kind of easy to understand. How would a Wolbachi infection spread without the CI factors? They give you something to like to do. It's a symbiosis, yeah. So there's, there's other Wolbachia that, they don't just have this, they might be giving you something else. And having the Wolbachia then gives you a fitness advantage. So by sort of like isolating the system and only thinking about CI, you're throwing out other parts of the equation that are potentially like, if it's improving fitness by giving you something maybe like B vitamins, then it's gonna be much easier to spread and maybe you don't even need the CI system. And the threshold could be lowered if the fitness cost of the Wolbachia was very low and it, it could even be lowered even more if the Wolbachia was somehow like advantageous to the mosquito. Does that make sense? So that's another reason why you might wanna explore. So this paper is sort of like one of the first papers exploring a few different Wolbachia infections, WML or WML pop. Another reason why you might wanna explore a bunch of the plethora of different Wolbachias is because maybe they would be easier to release because maybe they have some other advantages that would, they would be conveying to the fitness of the organism. And that would maybe lower the cost or the threshold frequency. Okay, good. So that's sort of like, uh, my best attempt to explain like nuts and bolts of Wolbachia CI releases. Okay, so step one, let's walk through the paper now. How much time do we have left? 25. Good, okay. So step- oh, 16, my bad. That's okay, we're still in a good spot. Okay, so step one. Yeah, you seem, you seem like you're trying to hurt my feelings. No. Okay, step one. Uh, what's the step one? I think, I think Claire already said it. I'm just sort of like enumerating the steps of the paper. <coughs> you have to insert the Wolbachia. Is it called insert? Oh, no, it's called So, oh no, Rachel said it, transfect. Um, I've heard different words for it. What do they use? Yeah, yeah. They, said, they said trans yeah. infection. So transfect typically refers to cell culture, like you're transfecting a plasmid. Is that correct? Yes. Trans infection, I guess they're saying they're taking a Wolbachia in trans from somewhere else and infecting. I would call this a heterologous infection because I'm used to like heterologous protein expression. So depending on like your language that you subscribe to, I guess it could be like one of these things. I guess it would not be transfect, it'd be trans infect. Anyway, create a trans infection. So where's their Wolbachia come from? We already talked about it. it's the WML or the WML pop. 
Those come from Drosophila melanogaster. So they're gonna do microinjections into Aedes aegypti eggs. Actually, how do they do this? There's actually some unique steps that they, if you read the paper closely, um, that they did. Did anybody catch them? They did do an injection to get it in, that's correct. But there's some like other things they did. They did a shell file thing. Uh, I'm not thinking about, no, not that. I'm not saying they didn't do that, whatever that was, but that's not what I'm thinking about. Yeah, the, so they generated three lines after injecting like 2,500 something mosquito eggs. But where did the, well, so, the Wolbachia, did they come from Drosophila? Did anybody catch this? So yes, the evolutionary origins of W. Mal and W. Mal Pop are from Drosophila and Melanogaster, but did the Wolbachia actually come from Drosophila and Melanogaster? No, it said it was reared in mosquitoes cell lines for like two years. Ago. Yes, so, so that's an interesting tidbit that if you didn't read, there are, and I don't actually don't know how to interpret this, there's multiple labs who have done trans infections of Wolbachia and in some cases you do what's called cytoplasmic transfer where you take egg A and you just inject or you, you pull some cytoplasm and then you just directly stab it into B and sometimes that is totally sufficient to form a trans infection. In this case that was not working. So what they did is they reared these Wolbachia in mosquito cell cultures for two years is what they say. So for two years they cultured mosquito cells and infected them with Wolbachia from Drosophila to try to like adapt them to mosquitoes. And then they were taking those like adapted Wolbachias and they were injecting those into the mosquito. So I don't quite know how to interpret it in a sense of I've seen people just get it right away and I've seen these group reporting that it took two years. So I don't know how to interpret it, but that's what they did. Um, okay, so then once they got it, so step one is transfection. Transinfection, not to be confused with transfection. Step two, what was step two? So you're trying to think of think about your in there scenario. You're trying to do trans infections. What's your next step in the pipeline? How would they know that? You'd have to do some sort of that uh, fish thing to see it, right? Yeah, so, so, so how would you, so they did do fish, we'll talk about that. What are they actually doing by doing fish? What are they, what's um, it? Dying the Wolbachia. To check what? To see where it is. To see it, yeah, so they wanna confirm, they wanna confirm infection. The genetic material. Yes, so they confirm infection by two different methods. One was fish, so what's fish? Fluorescent in situ hybridization, and what does fish detect? What is what is when you when you do fish and you do it on a microscope? What is actually fluorescing? What do you see? Yeah, the nucleic acids. You can do it with either RNA or DNA, but they do it with DNA. So it's essentially like fish is letting you see the DNA of the Wolbachia. And wherever you see that DNA, that's where it's localized. So they do fish so that you can see the infection and they see the infection in the ovaries. I think they see a little bit in the malpighian tubules and I think they see a little bit in like the salivary glands. They kind of see it all over. Um, what's the other thing that they do? They just do a simple PCR. So again, they're using like two methods to just detect nucleic acids, figure out where they are. Okay, good. Step three, what's step three? Then what did they do? See how well it like sticks with the population. Wait, hang on, what, what, see how well they what? Like how well the virus maintains its percentage in the population. That's later, check the phenotype is later. Well, we can put that as step four. Um, this would be phenotype. My read was, uh, did they? They did like a bunch of different mosquito lines. Or the, they did like a, they did one with the infection, one. So remember, remember the beginning of the conversation, which was there's two things that are key for this thing to work. One of those was the fitness. Mm -hmm. So did they ever check the fitness? They checked 
fecundity and um, yes. viability. So, and that was all within fitness, checking a fitness. They checked a few different readouts of fitness. One was fecundity. That was fitness of like females. What's another fitness measure that they checked? That's sort of like checking the CI. I would put that under like checking phenotypes. They also checked I thought they, I, did they check longevity? They checked larval development time. That's what I got, larval development time. Did they also check longevity? No. Okay, so they're checking like a few different measurements, I guess proxies of fitness, although like the precise definition of what fitness is is always debated. But they're checking fecundity, they're checking larval development time, and they're checking longevity. And what was their conclusion? WML does not produce fecundity. Yeah, WML was kind of like good. And WML pop, there's a, a little bit of a reduction of fitness, I think. A little bit of a reduction. So you might want to be, that might one, that one might not worry, work as well. Um, Okay, then they check for the phenotypes. So they check for CI, was there CI? Cytoplasmic component. Did they see that? Yes. Yes, so they checked for CI, they saw CI. Uh, that was good. And then once you have all these things in place, then what was step five? Actually, wait. Wait, oh, let's do, well, there's a few. So step, we can do step five. Uh, they checked, I'm trying to think of what they checked last. Did they check the dengue thing last? I think they checked the dengue thing last. Step five was checking invasion dynamics. That means like, is the population replacement gonna work? So those thresholds, how did they test that? They did like the lab, the little, <clears throat> they had a what? So they said in the paper, they say, quote unquote, caged experiments. Why is that a little misleading? Something like they said, similar field conditions. Yes, it's like a giant cage. <laughs> it's like a giant okay, cage. Where, was the, where did the geckos come from? They immediately said that they were eaten by geckos. Wait, what did they say was eaten? Oh, the mosquitoes? Yeah. Well, this is in Australia. So the geckos just showed up and they're like, oh. It's well, they probably, okay, so again, so think about think about what caged is. So in this case, caged has like a weird meaning. Like, I think they actually built like giant like pole sheds. Uh, and they're like, lines. they're like doing, like they're building, they're reconstructing like artificial habitats in the pole shed that mirror, I don't know if they're pole sheds, but you get the point. Like that mirror um, the natural like ecology of Queensland, Australia. They're like trying to reconstruct that in these giant cages. So they actually have to imagine this. They actually have to get enough money to build an entire like facility to do this particular experiment. Like that shows you how much sort of like infrastructure is required to do an experiment like this. Okay? And they do these cage experiments. Could you do an experiment like this in your mosquito knitting lab since it's like a sealed off structure? Do it even in our well, like, could I build my own ecological system in there? No. Technically, yeah, it's sealed off. Well, I would not, I wouldn't, you, like, you'd need permission to do that. And you would need, I'm sure they needed to demonstrate that, like, there was some containment, although if they were getting geckos in there, like, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I don't know. But you get the point. Like, they built these things, they built these giant cages to do these releases, and then they produce these graphs. This is, I think, the second figure, where they're essentially, like, they have this threshold that's about like 0 0.65, so they're releasing enough mosquitoes to get the initial frequency of the population at 0.65% infected with Wolbachia. And they essentially have these graphs that look like this, okay? So they measure the frequency. And if you look at their graphs, there's like four different, um, there's like four different points. So they essentially have two cages, so they have two replicates, two independent replicates. And so there's essentially like two graphs that look like that. And then there's a different color that look like this. What are the different colored things? One of them is a model. So remember how they have like these mathematical calculations? They do these mathematical calculations and they produce this like fake data that says like, it should look like this if you release them like here. And then they test that by actually doing the releases and do they, what do they see? 
it essentially like is their claim is like it falls in line with the model. Um, although like I I don't know like how well there's probably some measurement of like how well it matches the model. Um, but essentially like it replaces in the cage. Okay, so it works. They replace in the cage, and then step six, what's the final thing? No, nope, that's like down the road. That would be like, this is like a study to justify that this could work. And then after you did this, then maybe they'd give you like a hundred million dollars to do like the actual release. But what's the final step? See how well it stops. Yeah, does it actually like block dengue transmission? So how do they do that experiment? They test infected and uninfected. So there's a plus minus comparison. Um, the, net, the minus is going to be like the negative control. That's the last figure. And then the, there's two pluses. There's a W. Actually, I'll just do it how they do it. So they produce graphs that look like this, where there's a W. Mal, actually, it's the negative control is uninfected. And then there's a W mal, and then there's a W mal pop. But how do you actually do this experiment? So what's going to be on the y axis? Copy of what? And is it, so in this one, in one it's per mosquito. In one it's per mosquito, that's A, I think. And they do a tandem graph B, which is the same graph except it's what? Legs. Copies per legs. Why would you do that? To see where it localizes. Is that, or do they care? Do they care about viruses that go into the legs? No. What is that actually a measurement of? Why do the legs? Is it to see how well it affects the whole body? Yeah, why is that important? Just because like the dinghy could localize somewhere where the whole body isn't, maybe? No, but you're on track. Like you're right. It is to check to see if it goes out into the whole body. Why is that important? Yes, like dengue has to go through the whole process of the extrinsic incubation period where it has to bust out of the mid gut, get into the hemolymph, get into the salivary glands. And so measuring it in the legs is kind of like a proxy for is it disseminated? I think they actually use like dissemination well, of the just virus. Easier than measuring salivary glands? glands. <laughs> yeah, you should do salivary glands, you'd have to dissect. It's an interesting uh, question, like why didn't they do this salivary glands? That's an interesting question because it's in the top two journals, so maybe they should have done salivary glands. Although my suspicion is like maybe somebody elsewhere did a study like legs is equivalent to salivary glands, like so it's good enough. Non-entomologist, how does it, it get to the legs through the hemolymph? Yeah, hemolymph is a circulatory system that goes throughout the whole body of the insect. Gotcha. Yeah. So it's going to be a readout of like dissemination. That's why they would do that. Okay. But also this is really interesting. Like think about how you do this experiment. So now talk to me if you understand that this is what the figure is going to look like. And obviously, like you've seen their data, they produce data that looks like this, where there's high copy number when it's not infected, and this is essentially like either low or zero. It's the same, and it looks the same for the other thing. So it's essentially like with Wolbachia, it's blocking. But how do you actually do the experiment? So, so the readout is probably going to be qPCR. Q, it's going to be qRT-PCR, probably if it's an RNA virus. Yes, but. But even before that, like your QP, like walk me through the pipeline of what you have to do to do this experiment. Well, they feed the mosquitoes like a. They feed the mosquitoes what? So you have these cultures of mosquitoes, these three strains. What do they feed them? Membrane. So they membrane feed them blood from where? Something with the dengue infection. Yeah, where do you get where do you get infected dengue infected blood? The Probably the hospital. So, they, so think about, again, just think about like what's impressive to me is the infrastructure of the experimentation. Think about how hard it is to acquire dengue infected human blood. You have to have some kind of a connection at like the local hospital. You also have to be living in a spot or be able to get blood that is infected. Like I don't know how easy or hard or how expensive that is. But what if they just use like 
you like a hamster model? Do you think that somebody is going to let you do releases of a trans? It's not transgenic, but a modify. It's not really modified either, but the releases of like a weird new mosquito with hamster data. <laughs> no, like you're going to have to actually have like accurate readout data from like human blood. So they feed them human blood that's infected with dengue. I can't remember if it's dengue one or dengue two. They probably get it from some local hospital. Okay, and then and then essentially they what do they do then? They wait how many days? They wait fourteen days. Why? Because that's the end of the incubation period. So then they have to wait after the mosquitoes, and then they harvest mosquitoes, extract RNA, and then they run the experiment uh, and quantify how much is in the mosquito. The final thing about the data is. They talk about some of these numbers where in some of the WMLs or the WML pops, I can't remember which one, some of these where they had virus, what did they notice about these weird ones where they, it, it wasn't always absolute zero, and what did they notice in the ones where it was positive for dengue? They didn't have the Wolbachia. They didn't have the Wolbachia. So in some of these spots where there was dengue infection that came from the WML infected line of mosquitoes, they noticed that afterward they would PCR those and they didn't have Wolbachia. So this data was probably, how, how does that happen? Explain that to me. Maternal transmission doesn't work. Yes, they say that there are some cases where the maternal transmission is not 100%. And so if you pick out one of those mosquitoes for your experiment, that's what's producing that data. How does that, why is that important for the application? It's like the frequency of the... Yeah, that's gonna affect the frequency of the Wolbachia infection in the replacement. If the, so another thing, another big factor in here that this study revealed is that maternal transmission is a huge key factor for whether another one of the, maybe the third factor that is gonna matter for whether this works or not. If maternal transmission is super low in the mosquito or low enough to the point where you can get some sporadic infection of dengue, then it's not gonna work. So the maternal transmission also has to be high. And so now there's a whole bunch of people who are interested in maternal transmission dynamics of Wolbachia and figuring out which genes do what to control maternal transmission efficiency. Does that make sense? Okay. That's where I will stop. Any questions? All right, good lecture. Have a good day. Wednesday.